Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Dunn. Welcome to uh, the Atlantic Council, the Rafi Kariri Center for the Middle East, for this conversation uh, about Egypt's litigious transition. Uh, we'll be looking uh, this afternoon at the issues related to the role that the Egyptian judiciary has played in Egypt's transition so far, and also the ongoing struggle for power between uh, the judiciary and other political players, notably the Muslim Brotherhood and now and the presidency. So uh, we have with us two speakers. We have Dr. Mahmoud Hamad. Thank you very much for being with us, Mahmoud. Uh, the occasion for this conversation is uh, a new paper that we're publishing by Mahmoud called Egypt's Litigious Transition. Um, We'll have actual printed copies in a couple of days, but uh, you, have it, you have it hot off the printer, um, in which uh, Mahmoud takes a look particularly at the role the judiciary has played in the transition. And um, he is really uniquely qualified to look at these issues. He's currently teaching at Drake University. He's also a uh, professor of political science at Cairo University. And uh, I came to understand through some uh, ev events that we were at together that he really has uh, deep um, personal and professional knowledge of the judiciary in Egypt um, and uh, a lot of interesting things relating to the, the social dynamics and so forth of the judiciary and its relations with other, uh, other parts of the government and so forth. Uh, we also have with us, although you can only see his picture <laughs> by Skype, we have with us uh, Judge Yusuf Auf, uh, who is joining us from Cairo. Uh, he's a non-resident fellow with us at the Hariri Center. And if you read our blog, Egypt Source, then uh, you've already read many of his writings, including a new post that we just have out today about the judiciary and uh, uh, constitutional and um, other issues in Egypt related to the judiciary. Uh, he is a graduate of Cairo University's law school, as well as having a diploma in Islamic studies from the Cairo Institute of Islamic Studies. He's currently working on his PhD, but is also a sitting judge in Cairo. So Yusuf, I hope you can hear us. Thank you very much for being with us today. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to start by uh, giving uh, Mahmoud the floor first to talk about the issues in general and briefly about his paper. Then we'll uh, turn to Yusuf for comments and then open up to a general discussion. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks for everyone for coming today. Let me start by the most recent events. Yesterday, the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional Court, uh, which is the highest court of the land, had three important cases in its docket one of which could make headlines in any democracy around the world. The first one concerning the selection of the Constituent Assembly that drafted Egypt's Constitution. Theoretically, the court could rule the Assembly illegal and hence the Constitution illegitimate. Secondly, the second case was still, still is related to the Shura Council and the electoral law that made this legislative body and again, the, the Supreme Court could rule the election illegal and dissolve the council, leaving e Egypt with no legislative authority whatsoever. Third, the third case was related to the security apparatus, power under emergency rule, which is the equivalent of martial law in the United States. And the if the court ruled for the plaintiff, the powers of the executive authority would have been limited quite a bit. This is all yesterday. Uh, that being said, let me start by making fairly two broad assignments or remarks. The first, I'm arguing that the Egyptian judiciary has been, in the last two years, the most active and most politically relevant court worldwide. No other court or legal institution has been or has played such an influential role in any political field in any place in the world in the last 48 months. Secondly, generally speaking, the judicial activism has been counterproductive to both democratic consolidation process 
and the prospects for the rule of law. Let me provide some details. Transition from, transition from authoritarian rule is a messy, complicated, and protracted process. We all know that. Everyone who studies the transition understands this. However, Egypt transition in the last 48 months or so has been the most fragmented and the most judicialized in recent memory, if not the most judicialized transition ever. The, in many occasions, judicial overreach confounded the transition process. Many rulings and actions laid judicial landmines in the route of the second, to the Second Republic. These judicial landmines continue to explode with great velocity, and clearing it would take some time. There are three processes of dismantling the old order and creating a new order. The first is dismantling the institutions of the old regimes that inherited from the First Republic. And when we speak about the First Republic, we mainly speak about 1954 until 2011, so the periods of Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak. The Supreme Council of the Armed Forces that inherited power from Mubarak after he stepped down was basically tried to limit the scope, nature, and speed of change. So after dissolving the People's Assembly, the parliament that was elected in 2010, the SCAF, as they came to be known, refused to implement any legal or political transformation of the political order. One important foundation of the old order was the NDP, the National Democratic Party, which has been Egypt's ruling party and, in reality, a de facto single party for about 30 years. And many, so while the party headquarters was tortured in Tahrir Square during the, the days of the revolution, the party remained legal and its members uh, basically waited out the storm, plotting a comeback. And many revolutionaries thought that's a great threat to the democratic process because the NDB had developed an infrastructure, an electoral infrastructure that could be used in to, to elect members to the next revolutionary parliament. When SCAF refused to make the, dissolve the NDB, activists, revolutionary activists petitioned the administrative court to take an action. And for, uh, 45 days only after Mubarak abdication of power, the court issued a landmark ruling, basically disallowing and dissolving the NDB and confiscating all of its resources. And while many welcomed such a decision, because it was much needed, most did not foresee what it did entail. An extreme judicialization, legal actions taking the place of political decisions. And that ushered a slippery slope of extreme judicialization with both legal and political ramifications. Rival political factions concluded that political victories could be achieved or could be secured in the courtrooms rather than in election or at the ballot boxes. <coughs> in a transition period where the rules of the game are still unclear and unset, that meant that any and every political dispute could end up at the docket somewhere. Unsurpris unsurpri unsurprisingly, the rule started what we could perceive as an extreme judicialization of politics in Egypt, meaning the expansion of judicial power beyond the realm of legality. After the NDB was dissolved, the revolutionaries again petitioned the, the court to dissolve the local councils, which was dominated by the NDB, and the court again agreed to do so. However, the verdict was clearly political and had no legal base whatsoever. After the administrative court started the the dismantling process of the old order, the criminal courts became the arena where most of the strong men of the old regime were tried or were persecuted. So these criminal courts in the last two years or so 
was visited by who is who in the old regime, including the president himself, his two sons, the, a few prime ministers, the, a few ministers, the chieftains of the security apparatus, including the head of the dreadful state security police. However, most of the, most of the verdicts came unsatisfactory. Many of the police officers were cleared because of insufficient evidence. Many of the government corruption uh, went unpunished. The most important case, of course, was the trial of Mubarak, dubbed the trial of the century by many Egyptians. And the, the court delivered its ruling in June 2nd of 2012, only two days before the second round of the presidential election. The court, which again seemed unsatisfactory to many, because while it sent Mubarak and, his, and Habib al-Adli, the Minister of Interior, to life in prison, it cleared all the chieftains, all the bosses of the security apparatus. And in my opinions, and many others, the court facilitated the election of Mohammed Morsi. Because many thought that if Shafiq came to power, that would be th the end of the revolutionary process as we see it. The, the non-guilty non, non verdicts, however, put a great deal of blame on the prosecution office. Many blamed the prosecution, uh, which is controlled by the public prosecutor, who is a political appointee, of submitting insufficient evidence to, to the courts. And Abdel Majid Mahmoud, the public prosecutor, was under intense pressure. And it was clear from the very beginning that Morsi wanted to do away with this very influential uh, person. We, we have to remember that Abdel Majid Mahmoud has been a public prosecutor for about six years. He imprisoned thousands of the Muslim Brotherhood activists, including Mohammed Morsi himself. So there is a little bit of a feud between them. And Morsi tried early on to basically entice Abdel Majid Mahmoud to leave his post by offering him an ambassadorship to the Holy See, the Vatican. And while it was rumored that Abdel Majid Mahmoud accepted the position, he later retracted after the president announced his acceptance. And Morsi, under intense pressure, had to leave him in the post at least for a little while. Again, Morsi tried to remove him in November by issuing a constitutional declaration that removed Mahmoud, sent him back to the court, and appointed uh, Talat Abdullah, who was relatively unknown by many Egyptians to this critical post. This, of course, was met by a strong criticism from the judicial court, who saw this presidential decision as a clear infringement on judicial independence. It's important to know that the Egyptian judiciary was modeled uh, after the French judiciary. It's a civil, le civil uh, law legal system, and it has a strong corporate identity. So judges could agree on nothing except their defense of their institutional domain. And they saw that the removal of the Abnagid Mahmoud was a clear attack against the judiciary as a whole. After the court played an important role in removing the pillars of the old regime, the second step in the transition process is to create a new political order, new, new institutions uh, for a democratic republic. And of course, you have to start with election. And the election early on was for the People's Assembly or the Parliament. And it was run by a judicial authority, a judicial commission, uh, chaired by the president of Cairo, Abil's court. And the, the management of the, of the electoral process went uh, with relative ease. Many international and domestic observers uh, saw there was no, that was, the process was generally fair and free. There was no, much, not much intimidation. There were some administrative problems, but nothing significant. However, the courts influenced the selection and the electoral process in a number of ways. First, the administrative courts ruled that the Egyptian overseas expats have the right to vote. There is nothing in the Egyptian constitution that give Egyptians overseas the right or deny them the right to vote. And that has been an issue for about 30 or 40 years until the court, probably a month before the election, said every Egyptian overseas who wanted to vote can vote. And the, the, high, the high election committee 
uh, complied, and the Egyptians overseas voted for the first time in the nation's history. The second important issue was the eligibility of former NDB. The administrative court ruled the NDB illegal, illegitimate, ordered, its uh, uh, ordered it to be dissolved. But what about the members and leaders of the previous party? Here the courts, the administrative court issued conflicting decisions. Some administrative court ruled that the former NDB members don't have standing to run in the election. And some other administrative courts said they still had the legal standing. The high administrative court, which is the highest authority within the administrative judiciary, had to be recalled to issue a binding decision. And to the chagrin, to the chagrin of many revolutionaries, the court allowed the NDB members to run. If the parliamentary election went without much legal problems, the presidential election was a very different story. From the very beginning, this election, which was again controlled by a judicial committee, uh, chaired by the, the, by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Constitutional Court, had some very interesting decisions. The process started with the nomination process itself. The, core, the commission, which has, has, there is no, no legal appeal to its decisions, basically disqualified the three top candidates. The M Mubarak uh, last or only vice president and the, chief, the spy chief, Omar Suleiman, who represented the old order, uh, Khairat al-Shatr, the Muslim Brotherhood strong man, and the Salafi firebrand preacher, Hazim Salah Abu Ismail. And this, this decision changed the electoral landscape and betted Shafiq, Ahmed Shafiq, the Mubarak last prime minister, against the second tier candidate from the Brotherhood, Mohammed Morsi. The emergence of Shafiq as the only one representing the old order created strong feelings among many of the revolutionaries who thought that the Shafiq has a stand, has a chance to running to winning the presidency and basically restoring Mubarak regime. So the Muslim Brotherhood dominated uh, People's Assembly Parliament issued an, a, a new legislation that basically prevented old regime loyalists from running in the presidential election. But the, uh, the, the presidential commission refused to enforce it, claiming it's unconstitutional and referring it to the Supreme Constitutional Court. Uh, the problem, however, with this deci decision is that the, the, the chief of the commission <coughs> was the same person who would preside over the Supreme Constitutional Court because he's the Chief Justice. He has two hats. Uh, and a few days before this, the first round of the election, the Supreme Constitutional Court had two important cases in its pocket. The first one was related to the People's Assembly selection. And the second one was related to Shafiq standing to rule. Many expected the court to show some political cunning, not rendering a decision that would favor the Islamist altogether, all the uh, old regime altogether. But the court basically disqualified the old parliament, the parliament, and allowed Shafiq to stand. The third and most important, because I'm trying to run here, the most important process of building a new regime is creating a new constitutional order. And here the court intervened in many occasions to invalidate the selection of the assembly entitled to write the new constitution. And it became clear to many who belong to the Islamist camp that the court favors a particular uh, position or a particular brand of political opposition, the secular one. And many suspected that the court, the Supreme Constitutional Court and the Administrative Court were doing the bidding of the SCAF, the old order. Moving on, after Morsi was elected president, he basically tried to get the courts out of the way. As you know, he issued his Thanksgiving constitutional declaration, which basically tried to shield the political process from judicial intervention. And that, of course, was met by a strong criticism from the judiciary. What, what is the future? And Michelle told me I have only two minutes. So I'll try to be very fast here. The 
struggle between the judiciary and the presidency is going to continue for the foreseeable future. There is no doubt about it. Secondly, the court would be or is going to continue to be a focus of political activism in the mid to the in the mid and the long term. Judges would continue to use their supervision of the election to advance the political process. Judges would continue to use their political exposure and public image, public support to push back the presidency trying to control them. Morsi, however, is not void of political tools. He is expected to use or to recall Mubarak playbook using administrative and financial resources to lower some judges, divide and rule. He, is, he also has the right to appoint judges, justices to the Supreme Court Institutional Court without lowering the retirement age, but we can discuss it later. Morsi would have the right to appoint four justices to the Supreme Court out of 11 in his first term. If he is elected for a second term, he can appoint eight of the 11 justices, basically changing, backing the court, changing the political composition of, this, of the highest court. Mubarak, Morsi also would follow in Mubarak footsteps in trying to restructure judicial associations. In Egypt, the largest judicial union was called the Judges Club, which is like a syndicate uh, for all judges serving in the criminal and civil bench. And after the Judges uh, Club basically led the opposition against Mubarak in 05 and 06, the Mubarak security and legal apparatus basically helped to elect uh, Ahmed Zend, who is the current president of the uh, Judges Club, and he's an old regime loyalist. No one, everyone knows about that. Morsi probably would try to reverse this trend uh, by selecting or help electing uh, a judge or a panel of judges to the Judges Club and to the, its equivalent at the administrative judiciary. But this is not probably is not going to be the last time we are going to discuss the Egyptian judiciary, which is, which is good for my career, I think. Uh, <laughs> When I started uh, studying the judiciary in 2002, there was nothing going on. Uh, now there is something going on every day. And uh, Tarek, Toka, and Michelle and I had to work for uh, probably tens of, tens, of tens of rounds of editing and changes because of everything going on. So I thank you, and I'll try to stop here uh, because I, I went beyond my time. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. This is all. Um, Fascinating, and I have a lot of questions for you, but I, what I want to do now is to turn over the floor to you, Yusuf, uh, for your, uh, I'd like your, your comments on Mahmoud's presentation, and also if you can update us what is going on right now in Cairo. We, it seems that the, uh, perhaps the Shura Council will not act immediately on a revised uh, judiciary law, and there's talk of this conference um, uh, in which there will be some discussion between the uh, between the presidency the Shura Council and the judges club about any amendments to the judicial law so please Yusuf the floor is yours thank you Michelle um, can you hear me well yes we can hear you okay thank you Michelle for the invitation and uh, my pleasure to be with you today and uh, thanks for Mahmoud for this very interesting paper. And uh, I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, I would start by raising this question. Moving forward directly, uh, my comment for the Mahmoud paper is about uh, uh, raising just one question. Why this happened? Why all of this chronological uh, uh, events which took place between the judiciary and the power, whether the scab or the uh, uh, President Morsi happened during uh, the past 27 months now. In my opinion, I think there are three main reasons for what happens. But in first, we have to differentiate between the power of the SCAF and the President Morsi administration. Under the SCAF, Egypt uh, uh, witnessed like 16 months of case transitional period without any vision to, uh, to leave the country. The reasons for this and the implication for this regarding the judiciary can be seen in these three reasons. At first, Egypt witnessed a, a like, very, very big political vacuum after the revolution. What I mean by this political vacuum is that the scarf did not have the will 
and the intention to do something regarding the issues of the ex regime, like the uh, NDP, like the uh, municipalities, like uh, 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 many other issues which the administrative courts uh, decided upon it. Uh, lacking of this political will from the scab to do something makes that the political fractions to go inside the courtrooms and ask the judges to do something about this vacuum because there is no decisions, there is no decisions comes from the scab to handle these issues. This is the first point about the political vacuum. The second point is that the scab, did, uh, uh, to, my, to my knowledge, the scab took a political decision not to adopt a comprehensive project for transitional justice. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, there is some like, uh, the voice is not clear, I can't hear myself. It interrupts me, I'm sorry. Echo. Uh, keep talking, Yusuf. Uh, see if it's okay. is is it any better now? Okay. Now it's still working. No. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we're we're here. We're waiting for you. Oh, okay. It's it's better now. It's better now. Okay. Okay. Please please continue, Yusuf. Okay. The first point relates to the political vacuum. I forgot to say that it relates to the administrative judiciary. Because you know in Egypt there is three different judicial institutions. The general judiciary, the administrative judiciary, and the constitutional judiciary. The administrative judiciary moves forward and issues many verdicts relates to the political arena. But on the other hand, the general judiciary, which mainly have the criminal courts, did not take any steps, any positive steps toward uh, uh, having a political rule, you can say. But what's happened is that the lacking of the comprehensive project for transitional justice makes the public judiciary to step in and to try to do something relates to the trialing of the ex-regime figures. And that was the problem. The problem is that, I said many times, that the problem is there is regular laws and regular procedures while the country is witnessing very exceptional times. And we cannot do something for this exceptional times with the regular laws. So the criminal courts and the public prosecution did not have any tools, actual tools, to face and to address the problems of the country in this time. Regarding, I mean, the corruption uh, problems, corruption uh, accusations, and the political accusations for the ex-regime figures starting from Hosni Mubarak. So the, uh, the lacking of the project for transitional justice actually uh, first, I want to say that I did not mean by transitional justice here the exceptional courts. But at the same time, it's not the ordinary courts. So it's something in between. And we, we have to find some time to speak about this in details. But for now, this is the second point. The third point is the failure of the political fractions itself to handle their differences and to face the challenges of the country. We saw that many political fractions, especially the Islamists after the revolution, they did not have the desire or the intention to handle and to agree about specific or minimum points that can have the country moving forward in that time. The, 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 the result of this is that the, most of them, after having these differences and this agreement between them, they decided to ask the courts, the judges, to step in. This is very briefly the three reasons for what's happening and why the judiciary took this, this step inside. And my only comment about the paper is that it, it's, it's uh, presented very well what's happening in a chronological order. But I think we have to put in the picture another very important point, which is the judiciary did not took a decision or have the desire at the beginning to step inside the political arena, despite the fact that I agree totally that the judiciary made many mistakes regarding how to deal with the transitional period, especially from the constitutional court and the administrative court. So the judges at the, under the President Morsi administration, the judges feel that there is a severe attack that's coming from the administration. And they feel that they have to do something about facing this attack. So I can say that under the President Morsi administration during the past 10 months, 
the struggle turned from an attack from the judiciary to an attack from the presidency toward the judiciary and not vice versa. That's what's happened. But under the SCAP, the situation was that there is no political actors, so the judiciary was forced or sometimes decided to step in. That's, a, that's a, I think, my analysis for what's happening for this uh, important uh, dilemma, I can say. Uh, Thank you, Yusuf. Like that's, that's, yeah. About the, the current issue. Please. Uh, I mean, uh, would you please ask it again? So the question is, what what is going on now? I mean, we know that there was going to be this amended law of the judiciary put through the Shura Council. There were a lot of which would have would have provoked the massive early retirements that Mahmoud referred to. There were a lot of objections. Of course, Justice Minister Mekki resigned. Uh, and now there's been this offer of a, a judicial conference to discuss the issues. Uh, can, you, can you fill us in, uh, Yusuf, about what, what you see going on now? And uh, do you see any compromise emerging? Or, or do you think that there will be this continued power struggle? OK, of course, this is like a very complicated issue. And it has many, many sides to be addressed. At first, I can start by the issue of the uh, uh, judicial authority law. This is a very important point. I think that the judges club and many of the judges has been calling for decades now for changing this law to be uh, in conformity with the aspirations of the judges in Egypt. And this calling for the changing of this judicial authority law is taking place now for more than like three decades since the first justice conference is 1986. It's about 27 years now. So the Muslim Brotherhood now is using the, the tool of the judicial authority law to try to face what's happening and what the judiciary is doing toward the presidency. What I mean that is this is not the right time for talking and speaking about the judicial authority law because the high polarized country now is like uh, preventing any party from trying to do or to taking a good step toward reforming the judiciary or reforming any other institution. Every other party is trying to speak about the intentions of the others uh, in a very negative way. But what's happening now actually is that an uh, amendment which uh, was proposed by the uh, Alosa party, which is very, uh, 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 like we can say it's an Islamist party, and they proposed an amendments for the judicial authority law like one month ago now. And the problem comes from the only article that is uh, 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 intended to uh, get the age of the judges to be 60 instead of 70. And the problem is that of the problem is applying this in, in, in an effective, uh, in an immediate effective way. This means that more than 2,500 judges can be dismissed by applying this law. Of course, the judges club and most of the judges now is, is refusing this. After this big crisis, a delegation from the uh, uh, Supreme Judiciary Council went to the President Morsi and asked him to help the Justice Conference, which the preparations now is taking place for it in um, like two or three weeks from now. Uh, I think this justice conference will not give us any positive result because many judges, from what can I see in the courts and from my colleagues, are refusing having this conference in the right in the meantime because they have some skepticism about the intentions of the Muslim Brotherhood and that they are having this con uh, this conference in the meantime just for passing the judicial authority law with the retirement age to be reduced for 60. So the struggle is continuing, and we are looking to see what, what's going to happen in the next month. Uh, so if, if the, um, um, remind us, how, how many judges are there? If that retirement age was lowered, how, what percentage of the current uh, group of Egyptian judges would be retired? The Egyptian judges now are about 13,000 judges in the public judiciary and 2,000 judges in the administrative judiciary. So the overall number is 15,000. 
and about 3,000 judges can be dismissed if these laws apply to more money. So it's about 20% 20 20%. of the judicial body can be dismissed. What a huge number you can imagine to miss more money get 20% of the judges and the vacuum that can happen. Well, and, and then obviously... Then a, a large number of people who are currently prosecutors or whatever would be... Uh, would be uh, promoted to become judges or something like that. But it would, it would change the composition. That's, that's the main concern of the judges now. After having this vacuum in the judiciary, who is coming to fill in this vacuum? And we are saying that, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood is trying to have some lawyers belong to them and to appoint them in the judiciary. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Yusuf. Um, we're going to continue to the discussion now, but Yusuf, I want you to please um, speak up when you, if you have a point you want to add, I'll, I'll turn to you after questions, but since uh, we can't see you, uh, you need to, to speak up when you uh, want to add a point, okay? Um, okay, let, let me just start with a brief question. So, Mahmoud, I mean, my, my question to you goes a little bit along the the lines of what Yusuf was saying. Uh, it, it, I, I think your paper does describe very well a lot of the, this politicization of the roles of the, of the judiciary and the, and the mistakes made and so forth. But, um, you know, arguably, uh, because there's been no transitional justice mm -hmm. process, and uh, because there was no round table to build political consensus, sort of all the parties here have been taking, making unilateral moves in a way, right? I mean, the SCAF, uh, President Morsi, uh, and the judiciary have all been sort of, you know, going out and just, uh, you know, make, making moves mm -hmm. to try to shape the transition one way or another. I mean, the other thing I wanted to mention is it seems to me that the, the judiciary in Egypt has long had an unusually political role because of this unique system of judicial supervision of elections. They've been sort of, you know, dragged into politics um, more than other judiciaries are for a long time. So, um, you know, the, the question is, uh, could it have been otherwise? I mean, uh, it wor weren't, weren't they sort of forced into this by, by the circumstances? Yes and no, <laughs> uh, which is the easy answer. The, you are correct in saying that the judiciary in Egypt has a tradition of involvement in the political process that even dates back to the 0506 battle with Mubarak. If you know anything about the, the judiciary, uh, the history of the Egyptian judiciary, the roots of judicial activism dates back to a uniquely Egyptian experience, something called the Mex Court in the 19th, 19th century. Uh, Justice uh, Senhuri, who basically was one of the founding members uh, of the administrative judiciary, had, uh, had a famous say, basically saying, I want to make the judiciary supreme over all, judici over, over all state institutions. So this, this judicial uh, activism <laughs> has not been new in the last 24 months or so. That being said, uh, and taking into consideration what Michel and what uh, Yusuf has rightly stated, that about the inability or unwillingness of the SCAF to basically lead the transition. Uh, lead a meaningful, genuine transition process, judges had to step in. Th that being said, judges, when they are called into political matters, have a number of <coughs> options. The most dangerous option is to appear flatly as supporting one political side over the other. The problem, however, <coughs> that many, many Egyptians came to the conclusion, especially the Islamists, that the judiciary is acts as the political or as the legal wing of the secular opposition. The actions, especially by the Supreme Constitutional Court, for example, the case uh, that dismissed the first freely elected parliament in Egypt history, right, less than six months after its inception, was rendered after one session of oral argument in a specially convened uh, meeting of the Supreme Constitutional Court. The Supreme Constitutional Court usually in the last 20 years or so would, would, held, would have one meeting a month. It held two meetings for that month. And uh, without much deliberation. So judges 
made the appearance that they are siding or taking a side. I'm not arguing in my paper or in my remarks that the judiciary as a whole made a collective decision to conspire with the army or with the seculars against the Islamists who rule the executive and the, and the legislature today. But what I'm arguing is that many in the judiciary, especially at the Supreme Constitutional Court, see the Islamists as the enemy for a number of reasons. First, judges as a whole are a very conservative group. They usually come from a socioeconomic background that does not like much change. Their legal training in the bureaucratic judiciary would further gradual reform rather than major changes. And frankly speaking, if you have any affiliation to the Muslim Brotherhood under Mubarak or under Sadat, you will, you will never become a judge. So if your second cousin or your third or someone who you knew in your past was a Muslim Brotherhood sympathizer, you will never join the judiciary. So the, that being said, the Islamists on, did not play their cards wisely. Uh, when the parliament was in session, briefly, they had a legislation that would restructure the Supreme Constitutional Court. A side note here, the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional Court was, was established in 1979, uh, so it's a fairly new institution. From 1979 until, 1990, until 2000, the, 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 the Supreme Constitutional Court was a self-containing body meaning that the, the chief justice would usually come from the ranks of the judges serving in the court. So Mubarak would usually appoint the most senior justice after the previous one retired. And uh, justices would be selected by the assembly, the general assembly of the court. And slowly, a strike of judicial activism and liberalism was developing in the court until 2001 when the court issued its landmark decision, forcing Mubarak and forcing the regime to put a judge in each ballot box. Remember, the Egyptian constitution, as Michel rightly stated, has a uniquely uh, constitutional provision that required what we call judicial supervision of the election. I'm not aware of any other country that has this constitutional provision. Mubarak answered that before him in order to negate such uh, authority basically said one justice should supervise 15 or 20 polling locations. So you do all the rigging and then you bring the stuffed boxes to the judge and he can count it. And that basically facilitated the process by which the NDB would win 80%, 90% of the, of, the, of the seats. In 2000, the court said it, it, doesn't, it shouldn't work like this. There should be one judge in each ballot box. And in, 2000, in, the 2000, in the 2000 election, in the 05 election, witnessed a large increase in the number of opposition candidates winning seats. And that's why Mubarak, in 07, basically changed the constitution to remove this provision altogether. Uh, and in my opinion and, and others, this was a critical mistake because it made it clear for everyone who follows Egyptian politics that gradual reform cannot happen. Remember, if you know anything about Mexico, the BRI in Mexico was the ruling party pretty much like the NDB for about 90 years. But there was a gradual, gradual decline in the uh, BRI authority that allowed for a genuine political transformation uh, 20 years ago. Many in Egypt thought that the gradual political uh, change in the election supervised by judges would basically allow for this to happen, maybe not in our lifetimes, but maybe in our kids' lifetimes. When Mubarak changed this provision altogether, all political avenues for change was basically blocked. And that is, that is why many, many went to the street in 2011, because there was no way that you could change the regime from within. There was no gradual reform permitted. The, I think for the future, judges also need to refrain from taking political statements or making political statements. I, I have been teaching in the United States for about six years, and we have a constitutional, center, a constitutional law center at Drake, and every year we bring a chief justice or, or the, one of the justices of the Supreme Court. And usually we have a meeting with them beforehand, and we listen to their public remarks. And 
in no point in time any of any uh, chief These justice Roberts, the American US. chief justice, yes. In no point in time, none of them made any relevant political action. However hard we press them to say something about something that might appear before them, that is that is very different from the high political stature that many Egyptian judges had taken upon themselves. You have, for example, Tahani al-Gibali, who used to be the chief, the, the, uh, on the Supreme Constitutional Court. Tahani al-Gibali, if you want to listen to, if you want to watch all her TV appearance, you'll probably have to stop working because she will hop from one TV program to another. She also worked as an, a political advisor to SCAF, which legally that should not happen. She's not the only person. Uh, Hatim Bagato, who recently became a minister, is another example. Ahmed Zind, the, the president of the Judges Club, is a flagrant violation of any judicial decorum worldwide. The, I'll give you just one side story. Uh, two, three days before the presidential election, I was with a friend who, who was really close to Gamal Mubarak. He was Mubarak, Gamal Mubarak's second-hand second, uh, man, and he was really close managing Shafiq election. And Ahmed is then delivered a speech basically saying this parliament, this Islamist parliament doesn't know what they are doing. We are not going to enforce any legislation they enact. He is the first justice in history that I'm aware of that basically come in public and say, you guys do whatever you want. We're not going to enforce it. My friend basically picked the phone and called Shafiq and basically told him, please don't make any statements today. Let the news cycle be dominated by Ahmed is uh, that is just one brief example of taking sides. Uh, he's not the only one. I think Morsi needs to show the judiciary that the, he respects them, uh, which is very important for the judicial court. Young judges who would theoretically benefit from lowering the retirement age are against it today because they see it as an attack on judicial independence, on their integrity. The Brotherhood and their sympathizers also need to refrain from overgeneralizing, speaking about the court or the legal system as a corrupt uh, legal system, speaking about the judiciary, attacking or undermining the judicial court. Uh, because this would have, this might be beneficial for them in the short term, but it's very, very wrong and very dangerous in the, in the future because everyone in power would have to go to the court in a certain way or another. And if we develop a culture of not respecting judicial decisions, that is going to, that is going to be very problematic for any legal consolidation of, the, of democracy in the years to come. Right, thank you. Um, is, is Yusuf with us at this point or not? We're, we're, we're not connected, okay. So uh, we'll just open it up Absolutely. to questions here. So just put your hand up, if you, please. And, and please introduce yourself briefly. <coughs> Do you want to respond to that for each question? Or take a few. Yeah, okay. we have half an hour. Sure. Uh, thank you. My name is Ahmed Morsi. I'm a PhD student. Yeah, not the son of the president, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> the son of the president works in Saudi Arabia. So. He has four sons. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my question thank you very much for trying to uh, explain you. more and well, judge uh, of, uh, about the Egyptian, the complex Egyptian legal system. And I. I think it's very dif difficult even for law students in Cairo University to really grasp the whole uh, intertwined Egyptian legal system. Uh, my question basically uh, touches upon the constitutional court decision that should come out next month, mm -hmm. June 2nd, which for the three cases basically. And uh, I think since we have a similar case of the dissolving the parliament last, May, last June, um, for the same law, based because both both houses were run on the same law, so I would be interested to know what uh, what's your comment on that, of what you think of that, and number two, in regards, especially of the constitutional uh, the constitution article that basically give the Shura Council kind of uh, mm -hmm. an immune immunity from any dis dissolving in in the foreseeable future until there is a a, a new parliament announced. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Ahmed. So, as I said. The first case regarding the assembly that drafted the constitution, m my guess is that the court is going to basically say that there is no standing, that this is a solved matter, the constitution has been ratified by the public, and we can't do anything about it right now. 
that should need it should be taken by a grain of salt. Remember, political scientists rarely want to make any prediction because almost always we're always wrong. Uh, but that's that's my prediction, and I think my prediction is based on the fact that the Supreme Constitutional Court properly learned a lesson. The since the removal of the seven, the new constitution restructured the court. First, the, the, the about membership, the court we used we used to be eighteen. They removed the seven youngest justice, most junior justice. So now the court is 11. Secondly, the court power has been curtailed. The court has no power whatsoever to dissolve elected assembly or even local councils. Secondly, the court has no, has no role whatsoever in supervising election, especially the presidential election. The chief justice has, who used to oversee the impeachment process of the president, if there was to be one, is now out of the picture altogether, and the Chief Justice of the Court of Cassation replaced him. Although the electoral commissions will still be headed by judges, but, right? But, but not the, co the court. But none from the Supreme Constitutional Court. Okay. So all other judicial institutions, there will be an, a new uh, National Election Commission that to take place in about one or two years' time, after the next election. And it has a ten-member, uh, ten-member. It's a ten-member body headed by a, by a justice from the from the Court of Cassation and another right. justice from the Court of Cassation, two justices from the Courts of Appeal, two justices from the Administrative Courts, two members of the Prosecution Office, Administrative Prosecution Authority, and two members from the State Cases Authority. So no representation whatsoever from the Constitutional Court. The old institution that used to, to supervise all presidential election was chaired by the Chief Justice and included two members from the Constitutional Court. So three out of seven, no power whatsoever. So I think the, the, the Supreme Court basically learned the lesson. I hope they learned the lesson. Remember, judicial overreach is very problematic. And to make it, clear, to make it a little bit closer, if we go back here in the US history, FDR trying to back the court, in 33, and the, court, the Supreme Court basically had to change, amend its ways of looking at things. I think the, the, the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional Court is going through a fairly similar process. So that's why I said I don't think they will go as far as basically declare, declaring the Constitution illegitimate, because I don't know what will happen, right? If you declare the Constitution, uh, Constitution that we have right now illegitimate, <laughs> We'll have to go to the drawing boards and start a new process. This is, this is number one. Number two, the Shura Council electoral law is, as, 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 the, as Ahmed basically sta sta stated, is the exact same law that the court invalidated a year ago. And the court invalidated, for those of you who are, who are not up on the nuts and bullets of the Egyptian constitutional history, on the premise that because it does not allow equal representation for independent candidates, it's hence illegitimate, uh, which there are many doubts about the real reasoning. And that is why Morsi in his constitutional declaration and in the new constitution put a number of professional, professional articles that basically said the court cannot dissolve the Shura Council. So I don't think the court again is going to step up and basically s you, you guys have to go home. Uh, for a number of reasons. First, they don't want to basically make them more of an enemy for the Islamists. Secondly, realistically, if they cancel the Shura Council, the president would have the legislative authority, and he can basically do whatever he wants. So it's, it, is, it, it doesn't make any sense for them to do so. However, th that being said, the Supreme Constitutional Court is not, uh, is not known for its political cunning. So that's the third, the third case. I think they are going to rule that the, 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 the security apparatus and the executive don't have the power to search and seize uh, without habeas corpus even under the state of emergency. And, I, and that is their way of showing their commitment to liberalism without much in, endangering the political process as a whole. So they are going to rule out, rule against uh, the, the two plaintiffs for the first two cases and rule for the third. Uh, I'm going on a limb here, but I'm trying to make predictions. So. Because their rulings often defy predictions. Absolutely. They, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> OK, other questions? Greg. Uh, Greg Aftandilian with the Center for National Policy. Uh, thank Greg, you. if you're just oh. speaking to the mic, thanks. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious about some of these laws that are still on the books from the Mubarak or Sadat era 
that really go against freedom of expression mm -hmm. or freedom of assembly. Um, what what is the the court's attitudes towards these laws? Is the legislature the one that has to um, get rid of them, or can the court then declare all of these unconstitutional? Thank Excellent you. question. The court under Mubarak basically tried to walk a thin line. So the, they ruled a number of legislation unconstitutional on the premise that they hinder freedom of expression or freedom of assembly. However, with the most important powers, especially under emergency rule and, the, and transferring civilians to military court, the court, the Supreme Constitutional Court, even under Awad al in the liberal era, ruled for the regime. So when you hear the, 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 the claim that the Supreme Constitutional Court has been a force of liberalism, this has to be taken with a grain of salt. They know the political process and they know what is feasible and what is not feasible. Uh, and I think this is what, what is going to happen. So they probably are going to rule on the most important issue that comes before them, but I think they will defer to the parliament in the other cases. We res we, the Second Republic inherited an arsenal of oppressive legislation that basically can be used at will by the prosecution and the state apparatus to basically put anyone in jail. And they used that against Ahmed Maher two days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can use it. So they, they have it in the books. Morsi did not use it as, as often because he doesn't want to appear as authoritarian as Mubarak. But I don't think that even the Brotherhood want to change all of that. Because those are like a political reserve in your pocket that you could use whenever you, fee, you see fit. So I'm very hesitant to say that the new parliament, however its composition might be, is going to basically have a clean sweep of all this authoritarian repressive legislation. Some would change especially pertaining to political rights, political, political freedoms, assembly, the, uh, the ability to have a political party is now much, much liberal uh, rather than under Mubarak, but some to maintaining some form of social control would remain even if the secular opposition would have a majority in the future. That's again another prediction, right? Amy. Amy Hawthorne from the Atlantic Council. Oh, sure. Fascinating topic. Thank, thank you. you so much, and thanks to <laughs> Yusuf as well. I had a brief comment and then a question. My comment mm -hmm. really relates to what you said about judicial overreach and political overreach. It seems to me that a judicial overreach uh, is, n is not a good thing, but if the current government, any Egyptian government, attempts to solve the immediate problem through political overreach, merely through replacing certain actors within the judiciary so that they can continue judicial overreach. But on behalf of the current uh, regime, this actually is very dangerous and creates, actually creates more problems than exist even now. And it seems that even people who are closely affiliated with President Morsi at one time, the former Minister of Justice Mekki, President Morsi's former legal advisor, have now resigned uh, very likely due to real, real discomfort with this sort of political overreach to control the judiciary. Uh, my question is, if you could give us a sense of the composition of the judiciary in terms of how it will likely react to the attempts by the Morsi government to tame it or shape it. It's not a monolith. It contains many different components, groups of judges who are opposed to Islamists and to the Morsi government, who jealously guard judicial independence regardless of who is in power, who judges who support the Islamist project, and judges who probably are very apolitical and just want to be judges. So there's a real opportunity for divide and conquer. This is what President Mubarak was able to do to stave off pressures from the judiciary. Uh, will Morsi be able to accomplish the same, uh, the same attempt, basically co-optation? Excellent question, Amy. Thank you. I, I think about your comment, you are very correct. What Morsi is trying to do, what Morsi advisors are advising him to do, is basically old wine in new bottles, right? So y you have uh, a public prosecutor, and the public prosecution is very important for two reasons. First, this is the office that oversees all prosecution. So they can prosecute you or refrain from prosecuting you, and you can use this as a political tool. So it's a very important uh, legal asset. Secondly, they oversee all, all detention centers in the country. 
uh, and you all aware of all of the human rights abuses under the BFS regime because all the public prosecutors in the last 40 years basically never paid a visit to any of those detention councils, uh, centers. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's what Morsi and his, his administration is trying to do. Basically remove the old regime loyalists and replace them with, with some people who, if not closely aligned with them, they're not hostile to their program. As for the composition of the Egyptian judiciary, we are talking about thousands of judges here. Uh, and you need to distinguish, uh, historically speaking, there were few groups, or a few, a few uh, the first group was the people who are liberal in their orientation. So the UNSC, the judiciary, as defending the rule of law, human and political rights. And in my opinion, based on my field to work, those are the minority. Uh, I w minority. I would not say uh, they, are no, they are more than 10%. Remember, the Egyptian legal system follows the French model, not the United States model. So when you graduate from, first of all, law school in Egypt is an undergraduate degree. So you, you go to law school after you finish your high school diploma. And law school is probably one of the worst schools in the country. So if you have no grades whatsoever, you go to law school. Uh, law school and business. So if you, are, if, you are, if you are top of your class, you go to medicine, you go to medical school, you go to engineering, or you go to politics and economics. Those are the, the big three. If you fail miserably, you, you, you go to law school. So the quality, that has not been the case. <laughs> Sorry for all Egyptian lawyers here. Uh, but th this, is, this is a reality. Uh, very few would, would, would join the judiciary, because, would join the law school because they like it. But the tens of thousands who graduate every year are basically lacking in training. Uh, that, I'm, I'm trying to be polite. Many of them are my friends uh, and family members. Uh, so that the, the quality of judges today are very different from the quality of senior justices uh, in the Egyptian court today. The Egyptian, the Egyptian law school in the 50s and the 60s and even the 40s was a very strong law school that could, you could compare with very strong French legal institutions and many French professors would come and teach at Cairo University or Aaron Champs University. So there is, there is a variant in the quality of the justices uh, who serve. That, that is number one. Uh, and after you, after you graduate from law school with very little training, uh, you, you apply for the judicial authority and uh, the application process basically based on whom do you know. Uh, if you know, if you have mem family members in the judiciary, you're good to go. I'll just give a side, just to, 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 to fill you in, I have a, a close friend of mine. His, his grandfather was one of the leaders of the judicial uh, branch in the, under, under Nasser. I can't say his name, but you probably could. He was the leader of the judicial opposition under Nasser. And his, his, he, he applied for judiciary after basically uh, getting D's and a few C's. For, so he ended up with like a GBA of 2.4. Uh, and he, he, he joined the judiciary and they asked him what kind of like uh, questions they asked of you. And they said the seven member, the seven member panel that, uh, that interviewed him to say that he, is he fit to join the court or not, basically asked him, uh, Amid Mahmoud was, was the person who, who knew him the most. And they said, Ashraf is the grandson of our teacher. He is our mentor. Uh, how, is your, how is your dad, Ashraf? And that was the interview. That is basically it. So many of the people who joined the judiciary in the last 20 years joined because of family connections. And hence, be, many of them are old regime loyalists. The person who is basically handling Morsi's escape case from prison is the son of uh, an NDB leader and the former minister in the Mubarak government. Uh, that just being said, uh, so this, th th that's why I said that the liberal group is very small. You have another group, which I would say is, is a third. Basically, from the last 40 years, so it's their, their, th how they achieve their objectives is by collaborating with the regime. Uh, the uh, opposition to the regime would mean that you get fired or it could mean that you have a number of problems, financial or otherwise. Your kids don't join the judiciary. Those kind. So th there is a group. I think Ahmed is Zen represent, and, the, and his board currently represent this this group. Uh, Mokbel Shakir, who used to be a, a former president of the uh, uh, of the judges club, also represent this group. <coughs> Collaboration with with the regime would bring better salaries, better cars, and better equipments. 
The third group, which another, I would say they are another minority are the Islamists or, the, or those judges who have, who believe uh, in the Islamist political program. So, uh, and I say th those are no more than 10% again. So the majority of judges who remain are generally apolitical. The, the re closely guard judicial independence because this, the, the, it's the, their professional pride. And that is, the, that is why they sided with the liberal camp in 05 and 06. And that's why they are siding with is, uh, the traditionalists or the pro-regime camp uh, uh, today. Uh, and I think those are the ones that the regime should try to win their hearts and minds. It's harder now uh, because the regime does not have the formal control over the media that Mubarak used to have. Mubarak used to utilize the absolute control over state-owned media and state-owned newspapers to basically defame uh, a certain group of judges who went against him in 05 and 06. Most doesn't have this control. If, 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 I will, if you study the Egyptian media today, I would say 90% of the media are hostile to his program. Uh, you will see criticism uh, of the presidency veiled or clear in the state-run TV and yeah. newspapers, which was, would never happen under Mubarak. Uh, that is number one. Number two, the new constitution provides for more guarantees for judicial independence, except the constitutional court. So his legal authority over the court is limited. Thirdly, the new constitution prohibits the, the process, what we call seconding judges. In, his, in, in order to control the judiciary, Mubarak and his savvy minister of, of justice for 20 years, Farooq Abun Nasr, basically developed uh, a scheme of, of illicit control, by which if you, the judicial salaries were not kept, kept up to date with inflation to put judges under financial pressure, but a few select judges were basically seconding or asked to serve on administrative positions or giving advisory opinions, and they would receive some, in, some, in certain occasions 10 or 15 times their salaries for going an hour to serve as a presidential advisor or as a minister of finance, a minister of interior advisors. Uh, and that created <laughs> a, a group, a focal group of, of judges who are basically loyal to the old regime. Morsi can do that for two reasons. First, the public is very much aware of everything going on today. Secondly, the constitution perhaps seconding judges for what's called bar time second. You continue to serve on the bench and two, two hours a week you go and serve. The constitution basically said, if you want to go and serve in a, go in a government capacity, you have to leave the bench for this duration. So they can't benefit from seconding those guys to rule in their cases, which was Mubarak used to do. So that is th these dynamics would hinder Morsi's ability to, to control the judiciary as Mubarak used to do. What about then the ability to be uh, seeing that certain people get promoted into the judiciary from being prosecuted? Another, another good that question. Sort of issue? Y y if you follow the discourse since the judiciary law came to the Shura Council, uh, you see at least a fear among judges and members of the public, what's called back in the court that Morsi is going to fire or going to let those guys go. And in order to basically fill this, the overworked Egyptian judiciary, you will have to appoint uh, thousands of judges. That's again is true and false. It's true in the sense that could happen, but it is false if there is nothing new about it. The current judicial law that has, it was enacted in 1972 under Sadat permits the appointment of lawyers straight to the bench, not serving through the prosecution office. And, hmm. uh, but this was met with strong resentment from um, uh, the judiciary. So it was rarely applied. It was applied only in a few select decisions. For example, appointing Tahani Jibali to the Supreme Constitutional Court without serving in, in any judicial position. And the, the more extreme decision was Farouk Sultan, who, who used to be the Supreme uh, Court Chief Justice until 20, 2012. He used to work in the army, in the military judiciary. And then he was transferred to the, to the civilian judiciary, promoted to be president of Cairo Southern Court, uh, who controls all the election for the law, the Bar Association. And after proving himself loyal to the regime enough, he was promoted to the Supreme Constitutional Court, which he did a great effort in backing the court. Uh, so that is one way that the, the Morsi regime wanted to law to basically attract support from justice is the, is the idea and the new legislation, the proposed legislation 
of confirm, conform judicial salaries, that all judges in the same rank should receive the same salary, which is, opens a can of war. No one exactly knows how much the salary of the Supreme Constitutional Court Justice is, but unofficial numbers I received is talking about something between 60 and 80 thousand Egyptian pounds a month. Just to put it in perspective, a university professor would get something like 5,000 Egyptian pounds a month. So that's a staggering number. That's equivalent of to 10, 12,000 US dollars. You're the one that thought the guy is the liar. Uh, yes. Yeah. What? You said the, the professors get 5,000, the lawyers get. The lawyers will get like probably a thousand. No more than that, yeah. right? Egyptian yeah. lawyers are Egyptian not, well lawyers paid. Are not yeah. paid whatsoever. <laughs> uh, most of the, yeah, like the so this is this is one thing on the administrative court promotion is very fast so i'm 38 my colleagues who graduated are now at the rank of vice president of this of the of the council of state which is the second highest position in the court after the president it was only one president and th their, their equivalent on the ordinary judiciary are still uh, didn't receive the the rank of counselor they received it at 40. Uh, so the, the, uh, the salaries of the administrative judiciary is probably five times the salaries of the ordinary courts. Three to five times, just to be precise. Uh, so the, the regime proposed uh, in the legislation, all judges should receive the same salary, which seems reasonable, right? Uh, however, in the, in the heated political discussion, uh, many, of course, this, the, the Supreme Constitutional Court is dead against it. The administrative judiciary is dead against it. Uh, and the Zend has led uh, the ordinary judiciary to oppose the legislation. Uh, but this is something that is going to resurface mm -hmm. because this is how Mubarak co-opted parts of the judiciary, uh, kept all of them, especially in the ordinary judiciary, under bait, and then they would move them into important position or move their kids. In certain occasions, if you are too senior and it was going to be a, an embarrassment, they would appoint your son to an important position that he basically would receive a staggering amount of money. One example in mind is the Serri Siam, who used to be the president of the Cairo Court of Cassation and the president of the S Supreme Judicial Council. His son was appointed to, to, to be head of the uh, stock exchange, which basically is a, is a hefty position. The salary is there, is something like 100,000 Egyptian pound a month. Uh, so, if you are well connected under Mubarak, you had a very good day. Let, yeah. let's, let's say that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mohammed, you're waiting to ask a question. My name is Mohammed Mishawi, who is the Middle East Institute and Egyptian Daily Ashuru. Uh, I will add to what you said about C's and D's of uh, law school. You're not a lawyer, <laughs> huh? Uh -oh. no, no, it's really unfortunate. Not only law schools, uh, military and police academy as well compete in D's and uh, okay. C's okay. in high school. and the religious establishment. So our today li religious leader, military and police leaders and judicial leaders are really C's and D's in high school and this is dilemma in Egypt and who pays the price for it. But my question uh, about the m uh, military judiciary and mm -hmm. what's the relation between the, I would say, civilian military mm -hmm. system and the military, uh, the civilian uh, system and the mi military one. Do they compete over specific issues uh, before or after? the revolution and uh, how they cooperate together in this gray area of, of civilian under uh, military court if they have something uh, if I commit mm. crime against the military establishment or military car or officers I will be put in, in military trial how they deal with this case the civilian uh, court thanks Mohammed excellent question the military judiciary theoretically is part of the chain of command within the Ministry of Defense and judges who serve on the military judiciary are officers who are seconded to this position. Usually they have a law degree, uh, but they serve at the pleasure of the Minister of Defense, who is the commander in chief of the, of the, of the armed forces. Uh, so suffice to say, it's, it's, it's not highly independent. And it, 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 the, the Mubarak regime used the military judiciary in a number of important cases in the 90s to try the hardliner Islamists who attacked uh, many of the regime high-ranking uh, members. Uh, and the regime used the military judiciary for two reasons. First, swift trials, those like military commissions here in the United States that we use uh, for terrorist suspects. And secondly, because the due process under the civil judiciary 
uh, would basically hinder all the evidence uh, gathered through to co uh, torture or coercion illegitimate, illegal, uh, which was the case, for example, in the 1977 riots. Uh, the court cleared everyone that was brought before at the civilian court, criminal court, cleared everyone that was brought before it again in 19, 1980s. And that's why Mubarak used the military judiciary to basically get the preferred judgments. And that is why the Islamists and later the Muslim Brotherhood were transferred to the military judiciary because even the state security courts, which were partially staffed, uh, partly handpicked by, by Mubarak, did not deliver the preferred judgments because those were, were all uh, regular judges. You cannot trust them enough, right? Uh, so that's, that's when. After the, after the, the, one of the issues during the deliberation about the new constitution, it's probably, probably aware, was many wanted the military judiciary to have no connection whatsoever to civilians. That being said, that it will be only for uh, officers and soldiers in active duty. Uh, and the military was steadfast in refusal of such a constitutional provision. The military high command thinks of the ability to try civilian, they wrote it in the new constitution, uh, who damage the interests uh, of the armed forces uh, as one way to safeguard their economic advantage and their political power. And I think it was one of the deals the, the Morsi agreement, the Morsi administration had with the military high command after removing Tantawi and, and Ainan in August uh, to preserve some of the institutional domain of the armed forces in the new constitution, uh, which, which manifests itself in a number, of, okay, a number of articles, in addition to allowing the military judiciary to try civilians who harm the interests of the armed forces, the, the constitution had a peculiar provision uh, by which the Minister of Defense has to be a serving uh, military officer. You cannot appoint a civilian, you cannot appoint a retired person. And many in the army, afraid of the brotherhood, of the Islamization, basically thought that is an important guarantee and they could not waver on it. And if you follow, uh, if you know Arabic and you could go and watch the debates or the deliberation of the assembly, it's very much revealing about the red lines that the army put before the Morsi administration and the assembly drafted the constitution. So we will continue to see the military judiciary uh, in the picture. Uh, I don't think that the current military command is going to use it as vigorously or as widespread in the short or near term because they are well aware of the political ramification of trying civilian before a military courts that all Egyptians, I would say, say it, see it as uh, less than independent. So under CC for the short term, uh, in their effort to basically clean the military image after the failure and disasters of the transition process uh, under the SCAF, you're not gonna see it. But it is one of the tools that you keep it in your pocket in case someone comes near you. And I think it's, it's mainly for the economic interests. It's, uh, it's mainly to safeguard the military, the, 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 the industrial military com uh, complex in Egypt, which some people put an estimate, no one exactly knows how much of the Egyptian economy is controlled by the military, but it's a sizable one. So 20 to 30% would be a safe pick. Uh, and they go from tourism, bottled water, construction, everything you could think of, there is a military interest. And the, it is one way to reward the loyalty of army officers upon retirement or to supplement the income for army officers, high ranking army officers uh, in service. So that is why they kept it in order to protect their economic interest from defamation or those kind of stuff. Uh, I have one more question for you, but I also want to look around the room. Does anyone else have Alex? Please. Uh, you, sure. Here comes the microphone. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for a great presentation. Just introduce yourself, please, Alex. Yes, but okay. please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Alex Shalabi. I'm an Egyptian-American, semi-retired. I, I live in this town uh, and do a number of things, including come to Atlantic Council events, which I found extremely stimulating. Thank you very much for inviting me, Thank you uh, Michelle. Uh, it, it was clear from your comments, Dr. Mahmoud, that the judiciary under the Mubarak regime was not very independent. Uh, in, in fact, uh, was not independent. 
And, and you were bold enough to make some predictions when in, in a different context in response to another uh, question. I hope I'm not going to regret it in a week or two. <laughs> so so I, I, I would ask it. if you would uh, be kind enough to make a prediction on how you feel about the future of the Egyptian ju judiciary's independence under uh, an Islamist or the Morsi government, uh, just uh, so to deal with the one we have today. Sure. Thank, Thank you. Good question. And l let me just add sure. my last question, too, and then you can make some concluding remarks briefly, Mahmoud. Uh, my question, I, I hope it, you don't see it as sort of um, off on a tangent, but this peculiar uh, feature of the Egyptian legal system of these third-party lawsuits, mm -hmm. uh, we've seen them used extensively recently against the media, you know, where a lawyer or whatever, will bring a suit against uh, a media figure for insulting the president, not the aggrieved party. Uh, can you, I mean, this is a, it's, a, it's been going on for a long time. It, do you think, is there any possibility of this changing, or is that, again, one of these features of the old system that's, that's going to persist for a long time and, and be used for political purposes on and off? This is a question that only comes from a close observer of Egyptian politics. <laughs> so I commend you for it. <laughs> uh, so let, let, me take, let me take the future of the Egyptian judiciary and then come to your question. The, what I meant to say is that the Egyptian judiciary is less independent than how it should be. However, that being said, it was the most independent, most liberal institution under Mubarak or under Sadat. And many of the, many of the actions, legal actions and judicial rulings further judicial liberalization and political reform in the country beyond the limits set forth by Mubarak. Uh, Mubarak tried to control certain influential members of the judiciary. That being said, I think the, the, in, the, the whole or the majority of the judicial body is, is intact, is, is not, is, is, I wouldn't say corrupt free, but is, is functional. Uh, that being said, I think the future of judicial activism uh, and judicial independence, which is uh, a necessary but not sufficient condition for judicial activism would depend on the balance of power in the new, in the new, in, in the second republic. Experts of judicialization of politics uh, would would tell you, uh, from from combative study, that it's very hard for the judiciary to maintain independence and activism if one party controls both the executive and the legislative branch. Imagine here in the United States, if the Republicans, for example, would rule the White House and have the majority in, in the Senate and the House for the next 30 years what kind of judges and what kind of judicial actions or judicial rulings would come from the bench. Uh, so that is, that being said, the much of judicial activism would depend on the new parliament. And that's why you see uh, pressure from the judiciary to prevent the current Shura Council from uh, rewriting the judicial authority law, hoping that the new parliament is going to be to the more, more of to their liking. I have some bad news. Uh, it's not going to be. Uh, and here I'm making another bold prediction, right? Uh, you have in Egypt, I lost count, but I don't know, Mohammed can help me. There's how many parties in Egypt exist today? No one knows because you have a, it's like mushroom, right? It comes every day. 62. Uh, 62. Those are the official ones, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe there'll be 63 tomorrow, right? You never know, right? So, no, uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone who can name more than 10. Right, because most of them are irrelevant. Then the, the composition of the next parliament, if the election is held today, remember all the barrage about the Muslim Brotherhood losing steam and losing support among the public, I would make the bold prediction that the Muslim Brotherhood is going to emerge as the largest and strongest party in the next parliament. No doubt about it. The second party <coughs> is either going to be a Noor or the Watan, which are both are Islamist party. So, Relatively speaking, you're going to end up with a parliament with an Islamist majority. A strong Islamist majority in the neighborhood of 60% to 70%, maybe not, but definitely more than 50%. That is, that is said, I'm making this prediction because those are the parties that have institutional and electoral infrastructure on the ground. Those are the, the people who know people. And it is very similar to the, in the United States. I'm always making prediction because I studied American politics in my, in my, in my graduate work. You ask an American about how do you like Congress, and you basically say Congress sucks, right? Uh, this is the most common answer I get from my students. Okay. Sorry for the language, I, I teach undergrads. <laughs> right? but, and then, but then you teach them about how about your congressman or senator? He's a good guy. He, he did that and that and that. That is basically the same. 
many Egyptians, especially the active youth, would say the Muslim Brotherhood had done a very horrible job running the country, which I would agree. But you go and ask about how the local Muslim Brotherhood leader in their village is doing. And say, yeah, this is the guy that is running a clinic that we get med medical treatment. This is the guy that helps us when we have a financial uh, burden uh, and be un unable to pay for, for the school tuition for our kids. So those are the guys who are going to get elected again. The secular parties are uh, basically media. Uh, they're very influential in the media. Our very good friend Amr Hamzawi, right? Uh, Amr can only, was, was the leader of, this, of the secular opposition in Egypt, can win in two districts out of 700, 500 districts in Egypt. Masr, Gedida, and Zamalek. And Amr is a good friend. I, I can speak about him because he's a, he's a friend. My, my fr a friend and he did win in the first round. Right, but in Masr, Gedida, yes. <laughs> he, he, those are the two like upper class, uh, like the Bay Area in DC, in, 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 in uh, Bay Area in, in San Francisco, the kind of liberal, heavy areas that anyone can, any secular can win. Amr could not win in his, his, in his district in Minya, which is his, his, his family is very influential in Minya, right? And the same could be said about al Baradi or about the Weft or about anyone else. So you, uh, you end up with, the, with a secular opposition roughly a quarter of the, of the seats. Uh, so even if we delay the current uh, debate, it's not going to add much. That being said, I think the presidency is trying to retract. I, I did not anticipate th that firestorm. When they put the idea about raising salaries to entice young, uh, young judges, they thought that is going to be sufficient. Uh, but the attack on judicial independence as a whole is, is a red line for, for every member of the judiciary because it's professional pride, as I said. So I think what we'll end up doing either, either in this round of negotiations or in a few months after, uh, if they decided to delay it, is that they will not uh, decrease the mandat mandatory uh, age of retirement to 60. We would probably end up something, if they, re if they change it, end up something around 68 or 66 uh, with a grandfather closed for, be closed for people who are serving already, that you don't retire unless you want to retire uh, in order to abuse the judges. Morsi cannot do that today, even though that would diffuse the process because that would make him very weak and much criticized among his own ranks. So that's why they are convening the Justice Conference to come, co to come up with a proposed legislation that would, uh, would basically seem acceptable to everyone. Uh, the, the legislation, again, would also inclu should include a provision for selecting members of the Supreme Constitutional Court. The current uh, structure, the current legal uh, foundations uh, that was set under the SCAF basically creates a Supreme Constitutional Court that has no, uh, no example or no similarity to other, any other court in the world. As it stands right now, any, the, Supreme, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Constitutional Court has to come from its own ranks, from the three most senior justices, and members of the court has to be appointed by the President, by no, but nominated by the, by, the, by the court itself. So it's, okay. it's a, it's a self-creating body. There is no other court that has this power. And I think they are moving into some kind of elimination process that would mirror the United States and some kind of impeachment process to basically discipline judges if they go astray. We will see some of that in the new law. The second provision, regarding the third party, because I have one minute, the third party, this was what the, the idea that Michelle mentioned about one lawyer or one person basically firing a case against any other person who had no, no, no standing, no legal standing, right, uh, has been developed and utilized by Mubarak to basically push one lawyer, who no, no one knows, to say that this journalist or this TV announcer basically defamed the president and defamed the country. And then you can imprison him and the president can, came, can come on CNN or ABC and say, Or I committed have, blasphemy. Uh, blasphemy. Uh, I have, it's not only for I have no knowledge the of, this, of this case. Our judiciary is independent and I did, I did not file anything, right? Uh, I think Morsi is going to play the same game. Uh, so I, I, I hope it's going to change. Uh, but my question was, is there any discussion of this in Egypt, of changing this, or does everyone not, feel that not, this is not, natural and normal not, not and not just much, keep doing it that way? Not much, because everyone is using it. Yes. So you, ha you have people are, are filing cases against Morsi, asking the court to impeach him. 
there is nothing in the Egyptian constitution that basically said the court can impeach anyone at, 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 at leisure. And you have people filing cases against Bassem or against uh, Amr Hamza or against other people for defaming Islam or for defaming the president or defaming Pakistan. Right. This was the, the, the other issue when he had like uh, when Morsi visited Pakistan. So I think everyone is using it. Uh, and that's why no one is, is going to change it. But and this is also the power of the prosecutor general, right? Who in it, certain occasions there are can certain decide whether or not to it, if, if it's a felony. If it's a felony, if not a misdemeanor, the prosecutor general has to approve it or his office. Mm -hmm. But usually it's a misdemeanor. It's something that would not require major uh, jail punishment. That's why to go to the lower, lower, lower rank of the court. It's a way to make uh, your enemies pay uh, attention to legal process, that detract their uh, efforts from doing their business, and basically implicate them in legal disputes. And if you c have control over the media, can say, yes, our independent court basically found this guy to be guilty of that and that and that. And so it's a, it's a, it's a tool of political prosecution uh, in the legal profession. Yeah. Thank you very much, you. Mahmoud. Um, I, I think this was, uh, I really learned a great deal during this session. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank you also to Justice Yusuf Auf. Oh. <laughs> at least we got to hear his, his, what he had to say. Thank you so much. This was really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So